Uh, before we get started, I'll ask, this is a workshop, it's not a public hearing, so I'll ask the counselors to introduce themselves, and I would also point out for those of you who um, generally watch this and know where we sit, we're not playing musical chairs, we are meeting tonight as the Finance Committee, not as the Council, so that's why we're not in our regular seats. So, my name is Mary Ann Lynch. Henry? Uh, my name is Henry Berry, I live on Two Lights Road. And uh, I'm on the council. John McKenzie. Carol Fritz. Jack Roberts. Ann, Ann Swift Kayata. <laughs> Penny Carson. Um, I'd like us to uh, say the Pledge of Allegiance, perhaps, in light of where we are as a nation, and uh, then we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we get started, I wanted to um, spend a minute talking about what, this, what it is we're trying to accomplish tonight and what this meeting is all about. I had read some criticism of the meeting in a uh, local paper last week uh, that we were having a public hearing before the budget process is complete and that we're out of sync. And I'd like to take a minute just to explain the purpose of the meeting. In the past, we've been criticized for holding a public hearing in May and getting public input after the Council has completed the budget process. So this public forum tonight was scheduled to address that concern, to get public input earlier in the process. It's not in place of our May public hearing. It's in addition to our May public hearing, and it's for the specific purpose of allowing early public involvement in our budget process. Frankly, I don't think the timing could be better. On March 11th, the school board voted unanimously to approve the school budget of $15.3 million. That budget would have required a 4% tax increase, 2% more than the level requested by the council. But last week we learned from Representative McLaughlin that the state would restore $237,000 of our school aid. That will result in a tax increase for the schools being reduced from 4% to approximately 2.5%. I want to take this opportunity to thank Representative McLaughlin for her efforts on behalf of the town. The town manager likewise mailed his budget to the council on March 1. Um, that budget contained a 1.7% tax increase. So the public has had almost a month to review the town and the school budgets as proposed. Tonight, after the manager has presented a short overview of the budget, including the tax impact, the public will be provided an opportunity to comment on the budget. Additionally, all taxpayers should receive the new revaluation notices on or about May 1st, again, before we adopt the final budget. We will continue to have budget workshops on specific department budgets through the month of April, as is always our practice. And we will provide a final budget public hearing on the budget prior to its adoption on May 12th. So with that explanation of what we're trying to do tonight, I'd ask Mike to start. And process, uh, but the municipal budget review was, is just beginning. Uh, Finance Chair Marianne Lynch asked me uh, as well specifically to look at the, all of the, the various budgets and their impact on taxes, the municipal budget as well as school, community services, and county, and this is what uh, we'll do. I think everyone understands that, again, this is a, this is a really tough year. Last year when we put together this uh, proposal, you could see that we were really suffering from a lower stock market, from lower interest rates. Some of the retirees uh, who, who live on fixed incomes found that the fixed incomes weren't really fixed. They were, they were declining. 
and there were so many other indices that, that showed that, that things were in tough shape. And, you know, as, as was referenced just a few minutes ago, we also have a lot of un, uh, uncertainty in the, the economy at this point in time as a result of uh, what's been going on with the war. Uh, we also have a lot of upward spending increase. Uh, the very latest figures released by the Department of Labor on March 21st show a consumer price index increase of 3%. This is higher than when the budgeting began in the various departments of the town. At that point, we were looking at an annual cost of living adjustment of down in the lower twos, and now, in fact, for the last 12-month period, it's been running at 3.0%. A lot of that is because of energy prices. I think anyone who, you know, looks at what they're paying for heating oil or gasoline sees a lot of impact. Uh, just today, we, we received a bill, and uh, for example, for gasoline and diesel fuel, we budgeted at a dollar, and it's now a dollar 27. All of those things for the school department and the town have, have impact. Health insurance, uh, everyone knows what the health insurance percentages increases, they, they aren't very pleasant. Solid waste fees, I'll go into a little bit more later on. Wages, uh, you know, most of the, with the consumer price index being around 3%, most employees do look for increases of 2 to 3%. In the case of the municipal budget, uh, the police union will be receiving, the members of that bargaining unit, a 2.5% increase, and under the proposed budget, the other employees will be receiving 3% increases. The county budget continues to rise considerably, uh, something that our two representatives on the county budget committee have expressed quite a bit of concern about over the last uh, few years. Uh, mandates, uh, such issues as no child left behind, some of the learning results of the school department, as well as some of the stormwater regulations and the homeland security issues that the municipal government face all begin to add up to additional costs. Uh, additional training needs needs as well. Uh, for the first time, we're picking up the principal payments on the renovation of the community center. That appears as part of the community services budget. Uh, we, the municipal budget has the, the debt service payments for the purchase of the property, both principal and interest. The community services budget has within it, since they're the ones actually using it, the renovation costs for both the principal and the interest. So all of this creates upward pressure on spending. If you add together all the budgets, community services, as it's now proposed, the county, the municipal budget, and the school budget, the proposed spending is up 2.78%. Uh, the proposed spending increases, as the budgets now stand, the municipal budget is up about 1.17%, the school budget up two and three quarters percent, the county assessment up 6.74. Community services, primarily because of that principal payment, is up 14.83%. And the total is 2.78, or 0.22% or less than the current rate of inflation. And both of the, well, the major budgets that are controllable, that really contribute to the tax rate, both the education budget as well as the municipal budget, all are under the consumer price index uh, for the last 12 month period. The other side of it though is on the expenditure side of the budget, which, which you need to look at, is we're also uh, suffering some problems again under that label of it, it, it's a tough year. Uh, municipal, the municipal side, revenue such as interest on uh, some of our investments, uh, some of the state revenue sharing, a lot of these different things are down and they aggregate to 2.65%. School revenues are down a little over 11%. Community service revenues are up, and the really good news for community services is under the proposed budget that Sue Weatherby submitted for the very first time, the community services operating budget uh, is totally self-supporting. There had been a long time subsidy of over 60,000 or more to community services. There still is a subsidy community services, but it's only for the principal and interest operating, it's, it, it is now breaking even. Overall, revenues are down 5% or $346,000. And you look at those percentages, and you know, with all these percentages, you need to look at the relative sizes of all the different budgets. Uh, because the, so much of the municipal budget 
is dependent on non-property tax revenues, a 2.65% uh, decrease has quite a bit of impact uh, on that. If you look at the combined effects of spending uh, increasing and revenues declining, uh, the recommended budget has, has having been given to the council. Uh, the town tax rate is up eight cents or 1.7 percent. The budget that the school board adopted back, I think, on March 11, uh, is up 42 cents or 2.51 percent. That does include the change in the school subsidy, as uh, Marianne Lynch mentioned, in terms of the slightly improved picture as a result of the state budget that was adopted uh, this past week. The county tax rate is up four cents. Community services is up three cents. I'll go back to that in a second. And the overall rate is up 57 cents or 2.52. Community services would have been up more, and some of you may have seen earlier drafts of that budget, which showed about an eight cent increase instead of a three cent increase. The good news is, is that there was money left from the construction project uh, when the, the building was renovated. Uh, we're now closing out that project and it looks like to be slightly over $100,000 remaining in that account, some of which is going to be recommended to, to go into the community services account uh, to reduce the amount both this year as well as next year uh, that the tax rate will be impacted. Uh, just a reminder that the January 30th Town Council Workshop consensus was to, to direct the manager and the school board to hold the overall tax rate increase to no more than 2%. Uh, I think it's important to look at, you know, really what is the difference between that council direction on January 30th and what, where the proposed budget stood as they were given to the council. The 2% would have been 45 cents. Uh, the proposed is 2.5% or 57 cents. Uh, that's what's been at this point submitted by the school board and, and by myself as the town manager. The difference is 0.5% or 12 cents on 91,781. Uh, the school difference is 61,040. The difference between the 2% that was requested and the 2.51% that it currently now stands. The balance is, is the town is slightly under the target, county is over the target, and community services is over the target as well. Uh, I think it's really important to note that the variance, but, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, I hear a lot of discussion around town of, you know, is the council supportive of schools and all these different issues, and there seem to be, you know, these big divisions, but when you boil it down to numbers, you know, it, it's not really all that much money. Uh, the variance between the school board adopted budget and the town council consensus is, is as I mentioned, a little over 60000 If the council cut the school budget, you know, said that the school school board had to, cut, had to cut their budget to reach that, that amount of the direction, the school expenditure increase compared to what is now there, what is now proposed, would be $348,000. That would be only a 1.95% increase. And looking back with the consumer price index increasing 3%, you know, uh, that's a little, a little over 1% under the consumer price index, uh, something that ought to be considered. Uh, the municipal budget, I think as everyone is aware, uh, in order to reach the target, there had to be a number of changes. And there was a handout on the back table that on the second page listed what a lot of those changes were. This is everything from in 2004, there'd be no family fun day fireworks, eliminating the DARE program, reducing positions here in the town office, uh, reducing a position upstairs in the assessing codes planning, all out of state conference, and I could go on and on and on to uh, you know a list that eventually adds up to $423,200. Uh, the municipal budget met the initial council target of 2% and then some. Uh, it was 1.17% spending increase I had proposed as well as a 1.7% uh, tax increase. I do want to comment very briefly on the school budget. As the council, and this is really addressed to the council, uh, as I think it's important when you look at the school budget, you look at a number of things. Uh, the impact of inflation, the 3% versus the slightly under 2% that your target uh, would, would initially care to allow. 
the fact that there are reduced debt service costs in the school budget. Uh, there's a little, I don't remember the exact amount, but I think it's a little over 100000 Future space needs, are they really being addressed in, in the proposed budget? And, you know, for those, in the suggestions, you know, I've heard that there might need to be portables at X period of time. Are those funds, in fact, being provided for at this point? And also school enrollment. When we, we look at cost of living, we also need to look at how the enrollment is changing. And I don't know what the enrollment projection is exactly for next year, but when we look at when we look at school budgets as well as municipal budgets, we need to look at the fact that the population is changing really in, in total numbers as well as in the the backgrounds of trying to put this the needs of the students uh, in any given year might change as well. So you know I think it's really important to ask is it realistic to adopt the school budget that is 1% less than the rate of inflation when we have all these issues uh, that are pending. Uh, an additional concern, and this is, will be new information, totally new, it, well, probably a lot of it's new information, uh, but this one is totally new. All of the trash that everyone places in the hopper over at uh, the transfer station goes over to regional waste system. The town had budgeted for the upcoming year $115 per ton. That is the cost regional waste charges when we place the material over there to be incinerated. I met with Chuck Foshe, the general manager of regional waste systems today, after getting a warning from Bob Malley late last week that the 115 was not going to be adequate. Chuck Foshe said, Michael, you really need to go with $128 a ton. And so much of that is based on their debt service costs and the fact that when they built the plant many, many years ago, they had much higher principal payments at the, at the end of the useful life of the plant, although it's still far from that, and not at the beginning. Unlike the town and school debt in Cape Elizabeth, where it's level, level principal payments, regional waste is not set up that way. With 3,600 3, tons going over to regional waste system, the cost difference between what is in the budget and what is needed is a little over $46,000. The total RW SP increase, if you look at what was already planned in the budget, as well as what was what is now evident, is 88000 To try to absorb that in a municipal budget that is only up $83,000 is really stretching everything when overall everything else is up 3% for consumer price index. And you know, what, what this would in, so we already, half the increase in municipal budget is already going for an extra dumping fee. To add this in again, you know, I, I think what I'm informing the, what I know what I'm informing the council this evening is while I may have recommended a budget a month ago, as I think Abraham Lincoln said, I, uh, I wish to adopt new views when they appear to be true views. And uh, I think it would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to continue with the municipal budget with all the cuts that have already been made and find an additional 46,800 in, uh, in cuts uh, in that budget. Uh, is the consumer price index has increased since January and we now know about the regional waste systems fee and, and also, and let me explain this, as the school board is slightly short of the consensus request, it's my recommendation at this point that the council provide a similar but smaller expenditure level increase to the municipal budget as the proposed school budget. Everyone follow that? I've tried to find a way of saying this without being indelicate. Yeah, let me see if I can translate it for you. You're looking for the same percentage increase as the school board or something similar. As you'll see, I'm actually looking for something less than what the school board is looking for, uh, but that is higher in terms of the tax rate impact, but is lower in terms of expenditure level increase. And wh what I was going to say that's a little bit indelicate is that you know, there's, there's a dance that goes on with the, the different budgets, and there are recommendations that are made 
you know, overall to the municipal and school, and I think the municipal is looked at to set a good example for the school department in terms of, you know, let's all be even. The real issue is everything doesn't necessarily start even. While, while I think it's admirable and important to try to set those targets, sometimes, you know, particularly as we see increasing consumer price index and some of these other issues, the targets, while I think place important restraint on the system and on the demands and the need, sometimes if we really begin to look at the numbers, it begins to be less and less difficult to do. It, excuse me, so what is, to be more specific, what is it that you're hoping for? This is what I'm hoping for. But The next what, slide. Aha, uh -huh. thank you. Uh, I'm recommending that the municipal budget increase, this is the expenditure increase, be increased to 2.25%, and the school budget increase of about 2.75%. I came very close to saying that I was recommending the school budget also increase 2.75%, and in, that it increased 2.75%. You, you can read that drift through my comments, but you know, not having studied the school budget, I, I'm almost there, but I, I really felt it wasn't my role to say that, except recognizing for when we began this budget process, the CPI is higher than when those original requests were made. Overall, with the change I'm recommending in the municipal budget, and with a suggestion that the school budget ought to move along very close, if not what it is, uh, I would suggest that you know what we're what we're looking at between what I'm now recommending and what the school board's recommending is an overall, or what they recommended, is an overall tax increase of 67 cents per thousand, or 2.97%. This is still under the consumer price index, although very slightly, and that can change month to month, I realize. And this proposes an additional $77,085 in municipal budget. 46,800 of that would go towards this RWS TIP fee problem. Uh, I've also had many questions on having eliminated the hazardous materials collection program. You know, what do we do with all these chemicals? They're still there. Michael, you can't suddenly have them disappear without being environmentally insensitive. It would be my suggestion that, that that program be, be reinstated. And then there's also, there's about $15,000 that would be in play to go <coughs> somewhere into the system, be it, you know, some other problem that creeps up in any, any one of the various budgets, really. So anyway, so my recommendation is to, I'm really recommending a change in the municipal budget. I'm, I'm recommending that the council recognize that uh, the consumer price index is higher and that we try to deal with this uh, regional waste system issue. <coughs> Nonetheless, uh, I do want to lay out a few concerns. Uh, one is you know, a smaller tax increase, the, i.e. the 2% or something else, might be preferable, but I think we need to look at, at what cost. I, was, I don't know how many of you parked in the back end of the parking lot tonight, but you know, every time I go out there, particularly with the spring, the cracks are getting larger, and you know, everything you know, begins to fall apart, and if you don't do them, they do cost the taxpayers more in the long run in with, when you defer maintenance. Uh, we're also, we had a study done of how much we need to put place into roads, and anyone who drives down Furwink Avenue can see uh, what a problem that is. Uh, and we have similar problems, although the public doesn't see them as much, and our equipment replacements were just not keeping up with the schedule. I also have a concern, you know, I don't recommend really a with, with all, for all purposes a 3% increase lightly. I, citizens do have a limited ability to pay. Uh, all of those things I mentioned at the beginning are, in fact, uh, you know, concerns that I have. But at the same time, I, you know, I, I really believe to be at all responsible uh, that we, we, we are looking at something closer to three than to two. Recognizing, again, it's the council that makes that determination. And, uh, you know, they, as elected officials, listen to a lot more folks than I do on... Uh, on issues involving ability to pay. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I have a question. Um, 
just going back to the, to the previous page, um, you had talked about a municipal expenditure budget increase. That's the spending budget increase. That's right. 2.25 percent. What would what would that mean for the tax rate for the on for the handout with the pie? It's the yeah, I think it's the final page. Is this different from the one that this is the this is it's new mostly one. the same except the final page. Oh. The final page the final, lays out what you're recommending. Sure. 2.97. That 2.97 is the final page of that handout. Yeah. Does that answer your question? So that would be a 3.83 percent increase in the tax rate for the town, 3.75 for county, 2.51 for school, and 30 percent for community for an overall melded rate of 2.97 percent. That's correct. That's correct. The other concerns are the it, actually I, after I, I did this this afternoon, cost reduction, homestead exemption. Then I looked at the legislative bulletin from the Municipal Association, and that's now state law, uh, the reduction in the homestead exemption. What about veterans? Really, it is state law. This, the veterans exemption did not change in the state law. The homestead exemption yeah. did under the budget that was approved uh, by the legislature uh, last week. The revaluation will have impact on citizens, and I know no one will forget that, particularly after they get the notices. Uh, and we still, you know, we have the school project coming up in addressing kindergarten space either on a short-term or a long-term basis and we also have a, a significant issue with the aging of the high school that the I think all of the elected officials have understand the need to address this year and next year uh, with the high school as well and, you know all those things are out there so you know my sense is and you know one reason why you know I don't want to see a whole lot more substantial cuts mm. is, you know, there, there aren't going to be chances for reinstatements mm. in the next few years as we begin to deal with some of these issues and these, these costly concerns. And it really worries me of how we're going to come up with the infrastructure uh, investment of taking care of the roads and replacing the equipment and taking care of the schools, uh, you know, with, without some increase in the spending in these areas. And I think that's, you know, if you look at even the suggested change of making the municipal budget, it's, it's really to, you know, to pay fees that erode. It's not personnel costs and some of those things that, that really add the impact uh, later on. Uh, that is my overview. Uh, there, there were a couple of handouts in the back, and I also have these. Uh, I didn't hand them out earlier, but if anyone wants them, by the time we conclude, all of these slides are uh, on handouts as well. But I thank you, Chairman. Mary Ann Lynch, uh, for your attention, and I, and I uh, express my re apologies to the council. I know I gave you a lot of new things uh, this evening, particularly involving the regional waste fee change, uh, as well as perhaps I might have surprised you with some of my philosophies on some of the school issues as well. But when I looked at really in, in the aggregate uh, that the numbers weren't too far distant and the impact of the consumer price index and the fact that you know some of the school space issues really aren't recognized in the school budget uh, you know my my read of it is we can have a we, we will have i'm sure a good debate discussion over the next month but you know in the end uh you know my sense is uh pretty good convincing argument i hope will be made uh for close to the amounts that are on that final sheet so thank you okay. thank you michael and, uh, are there any other questions of from the council for the town manager. I, I just you did say you had the PowerPoint pass out that has these new things. Cause I I don't want to write anymore. I know you got it. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Well, um, we'll open it up to the public. Again, it's uh, the public's opportunity to provide us with your views as we begin this budget process. So, I just ask that you come up to the microphone and state your name and where you live, please. And you might, if there, it looks like there are a few people here that want to speak, so you might try and form some sort of line because that will keep things moving. Thank Reverend you. Denison, 63, Spillink Avenue. 
Our town manager is quite a salesman, maybe <laughs> instead of a manager. <laughs> I say to this council that sits here tonight listening to him and to the school department not to bow to special interest groups and this 3% he keeps throwing around and stuff. The people at home have the same problem and they can't raise their income 3%. One other question, I, I have a couple of questions. Number one, when he says a 3% increase in wages, is that for everybody or is that the overall cost? In other words, the guy getting 100,000 gets 3% and the guy getting 10,000 gets 3%? If it's the way it is, that should be looked at. That's not quite fair either. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing I, uh, another thing I would pick out of the manager's cuts here is I think he can get along with a lot less money when I see $29,000 for a pickup truck. Uh, it must be pretty gold trim. And I'm figuring it must be four wheel drive and it must be with a plow and it still must be gold trim. And I think that we could start running our equipment longer. I think we got no choice and maybe them cracks will have to get bigger. I think that you as a council, as our representatives of taxpayers, should be getting into this county government pretty seriously. Mm -hmm. I think the spending is way out of control. It, uh, it, top heavy and executives and pay, and you, I know you're not the only ones involved every municipality, but it's, it's past time that you took a strong stand on it is solid waste collection. There again, it's time and way past time that this council started getting into it. Our manager expresses the increase tonight. I think there's a lot of waste over there. I think you put your citizens in a catch-222. You push recycling, and yet the system isn't running efficiently and hasn't been for years. And you can just keep raising 10,000, 50,000. That's only 1%, 3%. Manager makes that sound pretty easy. It still becomes a burden for the taxpayers. And maybe uh, if America, these places can do it a lot cheaper. I don't understand how when a government owned project is tax exempt and everything, should be cheaper than private industry. But maybe we gotta go to private industry. Your school system, I think you've got a good school system, but I, I think it's got a lot of fat in it, and uh, it can be cut. And, uh, you know, I think Mr. Roberts had a good ex idea here a while ago on, you talk regionalism, and that was a good example right on the Cape South Portland line. It probably doesn't fit some of our society kind of people's needs, but uh, I think it's coming down to what can you afford and how much you're going to keep pushing to us. So I think instead of a 3% increase, you could have a 3% decrease and still provide the same level of service. Thank you. Thank you. Gerald <laughs> Perry, 19 Starboard Drive. Uh, I was not here at the beginning, so I don't know what the school board discussion was. But what I have heard, and I may be wrong, is that there is talk of increasing the spaces and teacher for the kindergarten. Which gives the impression to me as a former teacher for over 20 years that you are starting to talk about a whole day full-time kindergarten. My kids were raised in a town of similar affluence with Cape Elizabeth. They were well educated. I have a grandson in this school system who is being well educated. My children and my grandson did not have publicly play, paid kindergarten for a full day. First of all, to do any research. Children of kindergarten age get too tired. They don't belong there all day. What does your full-time kindergarten provide? Free babysitting for the mother. Some of them have got to work. My wife did. Some of them simply need some time to be away from the kids. 
if either is the case, believe me, as a teacher, I did not make a lot of money. My wife's occupation did not provide a lot of money. That we had to both be out of the house when our children were of nursery school and kindergarten age put a burden on our finances. But we did not go to the town and say, hey, why don't you guys all get together and pay for a babysitter for my kids? I'm upset about that. I used the dump, pardon me, the recycling center. I think that your idea of the swap shop is fantastic. But I don't like what I see up there. And I'm sure that it happens, and it happens with a great deal of consistency. You are, I don't know if it's required or requested, perhaps the town manager can tell me, that a sticker shall be on every vehicle that is up there. Did you tell me, sir, is that required or requested? We won't, we won't be asking questions tonight, but we'll be listening to you and then um, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, whether it's required or requested, you want an experience, go up there someday. Walk around, look at the windshield. I have stickers on my cars. You'd be surprised how many don't. Which indicates to me is how many of these people are not state residents, but bringing their refuse to Cape Elizabeth to dispose of it. Maybe it's because they just live right over the town line. Maybe it's because their town's charged for disposal. I don't know. That isn't the point. Something as simple as a barcode on a vehicle, which passes a sensor, which lifts the gate. Yes, it's expensive the first time. You've got to buy the sensor. You could charge two bucks a piece for the barcode to go on a car. Renew it every year. That way somebody gets rid of a car, the guy from the next town can't use it. I know, I'm different. No, I, I, was, I was enjoying it because it sounded to me like something we could do at Fort William someday. Uh, <laughs> so, I thought it was a good one. idea. Why are you right, Captain Lynch? <laughs> Let me say one thing about Fort William. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's very complimentary. I love it. I think it is fantastic that we have a park like that available where you can walk in or drive in, and it is at no charge to the users, whether they are from the Cape or from California or from Romania or Russia. Makes no difference. Having also looked around the park, you make it sound very easy. We're going to take and put up a lift gate out there and watch the line of traffic go around and come back to town hall maybe on a good day. <laughs> or people will simply find a way to park on the road and walk in through the gates that don't close properly. And between you and me, it's a good idea. It's a wonderful concept. Forget it. I lived in Connecticut. We had Elizabeth Park. I don't know if some of you are familiar with it. We had beautiful rose gardens, a pond, swings for the kids, tennis courts. God forbid anybody tried to put a gate up there, they would have been killed. Certain things are at no charge. They are for the general use of the public. The dump, which costs you money, is not. Thank you. Thank you. And before we go any further, I just want to make clear that the Fort Williams idea is dead. No one needs to write to us <laughs> or call us. It's dead, dead, dead. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
Madam Chair and Council Members, thank you for allotting to me your time and consideration. Uh, my name is Patrick Babcock. I live at 503 Ocean House Road. My wife and I moved here from Minneapolis, Minnesota a little over three years ago. Uh, at the time, we didn't have uh, any children nor any pets. We happen to have two dogs now, but at the time, we were afforded the opportunity to live basically wherever we wanted. Uh, and we chose Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and we never looked back. It was the best decision that we, uh, we could have ever made. We chose Cape Elizabeth for numerous reasons, many of which need not be addressed this evening. However, there are two points that I found necessary to address in front of this council, and they are eliminating the hazardous waste pickup, which I appreciated hearing about earlier, thank you, and the DARE program from the annual budget. A big part of the natural beauty of Cape Elizabeth is the fact that our town is kept clean and safe. And by eliminating the collection of hazardous waste material, I wonder what are we telling the residents of our town? Is it basically take it elsewhere, which we're finding that some people do Cape Elizabeth? And I think not. Uh, no other town will take on the hazardous waste of a person who is not a resident of that town. And at least that's what I found out when I tried to dispose of hazardous waste this past summer. I basically could not get rid of it. So what are we to do here in the Cape? Well, it's not possible uh, or is it not possible that a lot of people are going to just bag it up and toss it in a hopper down to the town dump? Or maybe since it's in a metal tin, maybe in a recycling bin and it gets mixed up with recycling goods. I could be wrong, but I think not. I think this is exactly what will happen. Hazardous waste by its very name is hazardous and to not have an option for such a disposal is to guarantee that the unhealthy risk of such lawless disposal will, in short time, become a dangerous reality. The second point that I'd like to address is the potential elimination of the only program, I believe, that addresses the issue of substance abuse in the Cape Elizabeth school system. Currently, that is known as the DARE program. I have read in our community paper that it is a program that some people do not believe has been working. And I ask, how would anyone ever know? DARE might not be a problem that, in, DARE might, might not be a, pro a program that in some people's eyes is presently effective. But by eliminating the DARE program, you're leaving our children with no education regarding this subject at all. The beauty of the DARE program and programs like it is that the successful statistics are always a mystery. After hearing the news of a fatal overdose or a fatal alcohol-induced car crash that happened to someone else's child, parents are left to wonder not only why mine, but also why not mine. There's no more difficult time in a person's life than that of adolescence, and our newspapers here in the Portland area are reporting front page news, to be exact, on what has now been called an epidemic, or an epidemic use of life-threatening drugs here in our own backyard. If the history of drugs and alcohol, as well as the current front page news has taught us anything, it is this. We desperately need to teach our children a bit more than just how to multiply, write script, and identify where Iraq is on a map. If we are choosing as a town to remove the only program that addresses the issue of chemical dependency and the dangers that are inherent with such a lifestyle, I would like to ask this council, what message are you sending to our children? What message are you sending to the parents who lie in bed at night having attended the funeral of their child's friend fearing his mind next? What message are you sending to my wife and me, residents of Cape Elizabeth, who are planning on having children in a town that has allegedly notoriously overlooked the problem that is the issue of drugs and alcohol in the daily lives of our community youth. Having the DARE program, or a program like it in its place, at the very least, affords us the opportunity to save at least one life. A life due to the silent nature of success of these programs that will, by its own very nature, have a ripple effect throughout the community. The ripple effect is such. Perhaps one child who has had trouble talking to his or her parents at home about this issue has found solace in the confidentiality of the DARE program that is in place at school. Perhaps due to the silent and oftentimes unknown impact that the DARE program has had on that child, that youngster chose not to drink and drive on a certain night. Perhaps that is the night that, that child chose not to put him herself in a position where, had they drank and drove, perhaps that child would have been involved in a fatal car accident. Perhaps in that car were also the children of other parents. Perhaps there were children of people in this very room this evening. Perhaps that car was being driven by that child also, perhaps that car that was being driven by that child also hits another car. 
Let's say on Route 77, a famed, dare, pun intended, I say, highway on which my wife and I live. Perhaps my wife is in that car, perhaps yours, perhaps your husband, or your child, or perhaps your whole family. The thing is, we will never know. And that is how the D.A.R.E. program and programs like it show us its success rate in numbers that we can never account for, numbers that never get added to the town records, numbers that you can't teach in math class, and numbers that cannot be bought or sold by the numbers in our bank account. The price to pay for eliminating the D.A.R.E. program, or for that matter, for what I'm told, the only program our school system currently offers goes far beyond the price our prosperous community is able to afford. The price to pay is always paid with, with human lives. And this evening, I need to ask our town council for the meager cost of $1,900, the estimated cost of the D.A.R.E. program, is that a price that we can in good conscience afford? Maybe Nancy Reagan was right after all. I say no, and I ask the town council in response to my plea to say no as well. No, we will not eliminate the D.A.R.E. program or an effective program put in its place. No, we will not pay for it with the lives of those who live here in St. Elizabeth. And no, we will not turn our back on the one child whose life a program like D.A.R.E. might help save. After all, that child might be yours. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Shankle, 32 Belfield Road. First, I'd like to thank the town councilors. I know this is very difficult, and you've put in a tremendous amount of work already, and I know you'll continue to do so. Um, as I look at the cuts that Mike mentioned, many of them have to do with deferred maintenance. And I think we have an opportunity here in this town an opportunity perhaps to save more money than we are. Many of us are very concerned about our taxes because they do nothing but go up and the level of income for many people has gone down. These are tough times and they're probably not going to get better for a while. We, we can look at this as an opportunity. Sometimes we grow an awful lot in towns, in corporations, in organizations, and we really could do with less if we tried harder to look at what we're doing. And I mean less people sometimes. Maybe we need to go through all our departments, and when somebody retires or leaves, as they did in the, the town office, is reduce staff instead of increasing it. And we can do the same thing perhaps with space. You mentioned the, the space needs in the school. When the community center was purchased, space was cleared in the high school that some of us had understood was going to be used for classroom space. My understanding is now that it's not being used for classroom space. It's being used for offices. I think we really need to look at what we're doing. We may not need a new wing to put the kindergarten in. We may be able to consolidate in other ways. We may be able to coordinate with other towns to order things together, to work harder together to try to save money, to work harder with the county to see how they can save money on that end because that keeps going up, I know, a tremendous amount. So I commend you for your work, but I encourage you, please, to be as fiscally conservative as you can possibly be. And if there are any ways that those of us in the community can help by looking at something and discussing it with you, I'm sure many of us would be more than happy to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Frank Potenzo, Ivy Road. Cape Elizabeth, like the state of Maine, says they have a revenue shortfall. We have not so much a revenue problem as a spending problem. State and local taxes in Maine, as a per capita percentage of personal income, are the highest in the United States. In the last issue of the Cape Coria, on the school budget side, said the largest item increase, $49,433 for a half-time special ed teacher at Pond Cove, and for additional ed tech support for special needs students. Also, $36,800 for what 
they call federally mandated standards of No Child Left Behind Act. I just wonder, why is the state coming down so heavy on towns if the towns don't meet the requirements or have the funds? What can the state do to the town? Put us all in jail? Fine us or what? I don't know the answer. As pertaining to those two items I mentioned, our kids who are left behind because they can't keep up with their studies, are they given afternoon sessions with present teachers to help them? Why do they have to hire additional teachers to help these kids get through school and eventually graduate from high school? In some cases, some kids might have to repeat a grade. That sounds like a horrible thing to a lot of parents to say my kid had to go to second, second grade twice, you know. But I don't understand why Cape schools have to hire additional teachers at pretty good salaries to help these kids get by. I think that the present teachers we have should be able to afford some afternoon time to help these kids so that the town and the school can save some money from having to hire additional teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Priscilla, Superintendent of Schools. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Town Council. I think this um, this hearing and the opportunity to a lot of citizens to speak before the project is underway is a, is a great idea. Um, obviously, in listening to some of the comments, it's not our intent to, to debate. And I, I just think it just uh, gives us more reason to think we need to do a better job in communicating what, what is in all of our budget. So my intent this evening is to just share some, some information with the council. Uh, it would be premature to get into any specifics of our budget because we still have not uh, presented that. As you know, um, our budget in full uh, is due to the council April 14th, so you will have a full two weeks to review that prior to our budget presentation to you on April 28th. So to get into the specifics, I think, wouldn't be uh, fair to the council uh, prior to, to uh, our presentation to you. But I would like to take the opportunity to share some things that are, are a bit different in this budget and I think is important um, in terms of this dialogue. Um, the charge, and I'd like to thank uh, Mike for the, for the job on his presentation and, and looking at both of the budgets uh, because I think that's important to do as we look at the needs of the school and, and the town. And I do appreciate his, his remarks. But just from the school side, we did take the charge of the council very seriously. Um, and that charge has been, was carried over um, for the school board, uh, from the school board perspective to the administrators as we created our budget. But just as a sneak preview, and some of the things that, that we did in this budget that were a bit different, um, start with even last year. Um, we anticipated this being a very difficult year in terms of um, the loss of revenue um, from the state. Uh, our GPA last year, as you know, we took a huge hit, close to a half million dollars, and we expected a similar occurrence this year. Um, the loss is much less, um, so I don't think it's good news, but it's not as bad as, as it could be. But I think the $200,000 budget freeze, um, or the money we gained from a budget freeze last year, uh, as I look back at it now, was something I'm awfully glad that we instituted, anticipating uh, the loss, because I don't know where that $200,000 would come from out of this budget. So I think 
in hindsight now is that it was, although it was difficult, we eliminated um, a lot of the work that teachers were doing in terms of not allowing uh, conferences and workshops and delaying some projects, uh, holding off on some supplies and even some hiring last year, I think really is going to serve to help us this year. The problem with those kinds of initiatives is that you can't do it every year. Because sooner or later you get so far behind that, that you're playing catch up two years down the road um, and spending more. Also, I think what you'll see as we present our budget is that there is some creativity, there is some innovation in our approach this year. Uh, much as, the, uh, as the, on the town side, in looking at positions, we as a school district uh, <coughs> look outside um, of our borders to do some sharing of, of positions. And through, through uh, the efforts of our special education director, um, we are going to be sharing a position with uh, Cumberland North Yarmouth. Um, <coughs> prior to this year, we have been contracting for a service. And sometimes when you contract for service, it's, it's, it's a better way to do business because you get that exact service. You don't, you don't have an employee that you're paying benefits to. Uh, but that service became very, very expensive. And by sharing a position with another school district, uh, we're able to realize a savings of, of $20,000. We also, um, through the work of our administrators at all, all levels, we really took a look at how can we do some things differently within the schools. Um, the middle school and uh, Pine Cove School this year have really been taking a look at um, administration and how we administer our schools and how can we share some of that responsibility. Um, the Pine, at Pine Cove next year, um, they are getting into a pilot situation that really looks at teacher leadership and teachers taking on some leadership responsibilities, especially in the areas of curriculum and professional development. So in that school, we are going to be eliminating uh, the assistant principal position and substituting it with a teacher leadership position. Um, there will be a savings in dollars, although the charge from the school board was not necessarily that it would save money well, how can we get the things done that we need to get done in the area of um, instituting learning results, creating local assessments, uh, providing uh, opportunities for instructional improvement, um, and not spend any more money? And the answer that Pine Cove came up with was more in the area of teacher leadership and providing that opportunity. Um, this will mean that the principal will take on added responsibility uh, guidance people will take on other responsibilities. So it does spread much of that work out, um, but there will be a savings uh, just by chance in what we're doing at Pond Cove School and eliminating, eliminating that assistant principal position. Um, and we are, I will say, informing this, the school that this is something that they're taking a risk on and we are, we are piloting and we don't know how it's going to work, but we're hoping it's something that we can, we can do in the, in the other schools that same kind of thinking. Also, in, in looking at this budget, as some of you know who have been involved in our long-range planning effort, um, three years ago as we developed that, that long-range plan, uh, we had a lot of dreams. Uh, we had an awful lot that we thought we could do to really move the school district to another level. Um, but then, unfortunately, things just happen with the economy um, and things change as far as our revenue. And obviously, it's a much different, we're in a much different place than we were when we created that plan. Um, there are many initiatives that just aren't, aren't in our budget. Um, we had a dream of having curriculum and assessment support personnel so that we can really get to the what learning results is expecting of us in a no child left behind act. Um, which are, again, federal mandates, and I agree, they're very difficult to deal with, deal with. And what can the state and the federal government do to us? Well, the, the one point something million dollars that they do give us, they could not give us. Um, so we do need to, as long as we're getting some money from the state and the federal government, which uh, may not seem like a lot, but I sure wouldn't want to lose that one to two million dollars between state and federal funds that, that we'd be losing. In capital, in capital improvements, uh, we're foregoing some roof repair in hopes that if we ever get to a project at the high school, then we can hold off some repairs. 
And again, this is another issue that we only can hold off for so long, but we've taken some of those capital projects out of the budget. We've held off on the, pur uh, the purchase of furniture uh, for the last few years. We did have a replacement plan similar to the town in looking at replacing their equipment. Um, and it's a great plan when it works and that as things, gets out, things get outdated and need to be replaced, if you do that every year on a regular cycle, it doesn't cost you a lot of money when everything goes all at once. The fear with where we are now in the schools is we keep reducing lines like equipment and furniture. At some point, we're going to have to purchase these things, but those things are not in this budget. A lot of technology updates are not included in the budget. As you know, with the, the laptop initiative at the middle school, uh, the middle school is a wireless uh, facility. Um, our hope was to move in that direction. In the other schools, we put that on hold. Uh, we put on hold increasing bandwidth connections, um, wireless connections in both schools, software updates, all of those kinds of things have been put on hold in this budget. As far as the learning results and no child left behind legislation, um, rather than get into a lengthy conversation about uh, the chapter 127, which does require that the present mm -hmm. eighth graders um, be at a certain level as for, for graduation from high school, um, the state of Maine is, is not quite sure what all that is going to look like. But we do know that we're going to have some students that, that we really will need to work with, and it wouldn't be fair um, for us not to provide that service. Fortunately, we're probably in a much better place as, as if you look strictly at MEA scores, we probably score at the top of the state. I'm, talk, I'm talking to surrounding superintendents and communities just like us. Um, I didn't feel too bad that we weren't nearly as bad as some of those towns were and what they're going to have to do. Otherwise, in some of those towns, 50, 60, and 70 percent of the kids just aren't going to graduate from high school. I, I just can't imagine how that's going to impact those particular towns. Um, we do have some issues that, that we know we will need to address in the future. Um, our high school will be undergoing a, a, their 10-year accrediting uh, visit so that they will be an accredited high school. Um, there are certain standards that we, are, um, uh, we know we are going to be cited on. For instance, our recommended top number of students per guidance counselor, uh, 250 to 1. We are now 275 to 1, and the year after next, we will be 300 to 1, um, but there are no new positions for guidance. Um, we know also with the size of our athletic program, it's always been a goal to have a full-time athletic administrator, which we do not have, uh, is not in this budget. I think in an, as far as programs are concerned, and again, the high school using some creativity, as we have a Latin program this year for um, two sections of, of Latin one, what we decided to do rather than increase, because obviously kids go on from Latin one to Latin two, is we will be offering, um, you know, just the two sections, um, and either, one, either two sections of Latin two and then offer Latin one on an every other year basis rather than increase um, the budget in that area, but still offer that service to students and they can get the two years of Latin, but they would just have the time when they would take that. And finally, as far as operations, those supply lines uh, keep getting hit every year. Um, and at some point in time, we're, we're just going to have to to increase those. But obviously, this is not the year to do that. And our field trips, um, once again, have been cut to zero so that our classroom field trips will be fully funded uh, by the parents. So there are a lot of positives and negatives that you'll see when we present our budget to you, and, and, but we also realize these are difficult times. And I do look forward to our formal presentation in April and anticipate um, your feedback. Um, if at any time any of the counselors would like to sit down with uh, business manager Colin Portia or myself, we would, we would be more than happy um, to give you more detailed information so that you can try and understand our budget and um, I think the, the great job that the administrators did in this year to get a budget that is at 2.75 percent increase um, uh, that will still maintain our program at the level that, that we've always expected. 
I know we'll be hearing a little bit from just one other board member this evening, Elaine Maloney, who is our finance chair. And she will just give you kind of a brief overview, not for your benefit as much, but also for the people in the public that are here today, because you'll be hearing, I know, an awful lot more about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tom. Good evening. Uh, I am Elaine Maloney, and I am the finance chair of the school board. Um, I'd just like to take a few, uh, share a few comments with you um, and the public regarding our proposed school budget for the upcoming year. Uh, I'll start out briefly by revisiting last year's challenging budget process, just so that everyone's aware of what happened last year and how it uh, affects this year. Uh, we did experience the $486,000 cut in GPA for our schools. Uh, despite the challenges of taking such a hit, our budget did still allow us to address the increased enrollment issues, uh, increased special education needs, and the rising cost for health care. Uh, in our teacher's salary and benefit packages. Those essential new costs, coupled with that GPA loss, required cuts last year also to get us to that final 4.5 school budget increase. Last year's cuts range from, as Tom had mentioned, the elimination of funding for field trips at $10,000 um, to such large cuts as $118,000 from the capital improvement in our equipment budget. Class sizes at the high school were ultimately increased to balance our new needs with the previous needs, and every school and every department took to task the goal of providing the essential elements of education with the best allocation of money. When the school board met with town council back in January, our dialogue focused on developing another fiscally conservative budget for the upcoming year. I think we were clear in stating that our budget development would start with a needs-based process, but we would then look to creatively reallocate, reprioritize, and share services, some of which Tom shared with you. Um, I'm very proud of the way the schools have looked to use this limited money uh, differently, but still deliver the quality education that uh, we all strive for. Our district leadership team heard this conservative message very early on in their budget development. In order to meet some of those newly established needs that we're, we're hearing tonight um, and to minimize that effect of the GPA loss, every, every department again had to come up with a variety of cuts um, that Tom shared. So I want to kind of move on to where some people are seeming to focus on, which is some of the areas that are new needs that the school board feels that we need to address. And the first was the addition of this half-time special ed teacher for our kindergarten students who would be moving up to the first grade full day program. Uh, we also needed to upgrade the requirements. Excuse me, Elaine, can I just um, point a clarification for a minute? When you say new needs, these are items that are in the budget that the school board voted on in, on March 11th? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we mentioned to them back in, in um, January there were a couple of issues that we knew right up front that needed to be addressed, so those have been in our budget all along. Um, but I believe one of them was at that time that we w might need <coughs> a half-time kindergarten teacher based on the future projections. Um, and right now we're taking a chance that we're not going to need that kindergarten teacher. But these other three items we did discuss in January, and there were the halftime special ed teacher for the first grade uh, students, and also the fact that we needed to upgrade the requirements and the salary of three of our ed techs at the high school so that they could meet the programming needs of those high school students um, there. Um, I hate to constantly use the word mandated because it makes it sound like we do it against our will. And sometimes I think the community thinks that way also, but that really isn't necessarily the case. Um, these initiatives are something that the school board would want to do either way, um, because we feel it's our goal to educate all learners to their p best potential. And to turn away from this type of responsibility um, would just not be just. 
but the mandates do force our hand as to timetables and the second new program included in the budget is again mandated by the main state learning results and the no child left behind act and as tom had mentioned um, we do have that current eighth graders that will be the first class that will need to meet these standards in order for them to graduate i think that the details of it our administrators would be willing to share with you um, during our budget presentation but it does utilize a variety of programs um, ranging from possibly a before and an after school program perhaps a summer school um, an in-house computer assistant program that can be used during the daytime by the students um, and then we do need this teacher stipend so that we can facilitate the progress for these students so they will be able to graduate um, the, the last item um, that we, you might want to consider as a, a new expenditure relates to the main laptop initiative that I know that many of you either witnessed firsthand or have read about. Um, last year we were supplied with 150 laptops that we have been incredibly fortunate to have tech support coming from our existing faculty and our <coughs> own students on the I team that many of you met during our building <coughs> presentation. But the arrival of another 150 laptops will push our technology department past its limits. The proposed budget uh, pro provides for our present computer lab ed tech to be assigned a half-time position to oversee and integrate these laptops. Um, because we will now have over 300 of these wireless units in our middle school alone. <coughs> Reducing any budget whether it be the towns or our schools, um, I think we all realize that it's a difficult job and it each has its unique challenges. Education is very much personnel driven. Our teachers are our most valuable asset as they are the ones closest to affecting positive learning for our students. 78% of our budget is represented by their salaries and benefits. Now, there's two things that determine why this number seems so large um, and it's much larger than say the municipal side which I believe it runs around 50% or what you often see in many businesses this number is driven by the number of teachers that we must employ and the salaries and benefits that we pay them so I guess probably the next question is would be from people with do we have too many teachers or do we pay our teachers too much let me assure you up front their salaries and their benefits remain in the middle when compared to surrounding communities in southern maine secondly the number of teachers we hire are driven by class size and again let me assure you that our class sizes k through six are similar to surrounding communities last year we increased the class size at the high school when you increase classes at the high school level, you effectively increase the student teacher load, which ultimately is the real measure of standards <coughs> for the seventh to 12th grade level. We seek to maintain average full-time teacher loads at the high school of between 75 and 90 students, and educational research supports that we should be even lower. We currently have teachers at both the middle school and high school with over 100 students. We would be happy to provide you with all the data and our policies that will support these facts and comparisons. But back to my original point, um, about 75% of our budget. It is a <coughs> well-managed contracted salary and benefits. 7% is in debt, leaving us really only 15% of our budget to be played with when it comes to cost cutting. If you throw in some of those unfunded mandates, I hope you can begin to see how difficult it is to cap an education budget with a national cost of living increase figure. I think I can speak for all the members of the school, school board when I say that we are concerned about the long-term prognosis of our schools when we sustain minimal budgets in education over the course of time. As you are aware, and I think as you heard Mike say, you can delay a capital improvement, but it never really goes away. Um, it catches up with you at some point. You can tread water and you can retain status quo with your schools, but is that where Cape Elizabeth wants to be when we look long term towards educating our future citizens? I believe in our schools. 
and continue to be impressed with the work our teachers and administrators do when presented with some of these very challenges. Our hope is to be able to get back on track and start moving forward educationally so that our students can be as well prepared for the opportunities that await them as many of the other students in our nation. I look forward to providing the details on April 28th and um, be ready to answer any questions you have then. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Dr. Mulatto to the 12th and Dr. Um, where would you have never Could you repeat your name again, please? Yeah, sorry. I'm a little nervous. I've never done this before. So, so Dr. Mollette, 12 on Duck Road. Um, I think I just want to start with saying that, um, and I think we've said it before, these are very difficult times. <clears throat> I think we're all facing some difficult questions on the national level and state level and local level. And I don't think anybody wishes any hardship on anybody. Um, and I think that tonight I'm really impressed by um, how both the municipal and school board um, manager have, have, have understood that, have heard it, and I think it's pretty apparent that they've been trying to work within those <clears throat> realities. Um, I saw quite a bit of restraint in um, the town budget, and I appreciate the effort made. And it seems that um, similar restraint is going to be echoed in the school budget. You know, it's a fine balancing act. Um, while we don't want those who are on fixed income to suffer um, any due um, hardship, uh, we also need the town not to suffer any undue hardship. And I think that um, from year to year, you're going to see an increase in cost. That's called inflation. That's just the reality of life, reality of finance, the reality of economics. <coughs> and um, I, didn't, I wasn't very familiar with the CPI, but it sounds like what is being proposed is very much within the CPI. I don't think that that's really unreasonable. Um, in terms of the school project, my feeling is that these have been problems for a long time. Uh, it kind of astounds me that in the 30 years that the high school was built, that no major repairs or improvements have been done. Um, I actually grew up in this area. My grandparents lived two houses down where I currently live. I always looked at Cape Elizabeth High School and school system with, uh, say, some envy. I was green with envy of what they had. And I think some people here have commented on how excellent the um, education was. And I think as um, recently as, uh, I think it was like eight years ago, and <clears throat> Cape Elizabeth was ranked number four in the state for spending for students. And I understand that that ranking today is around 30. And that worries me. Um, I'm here with my children. We came back to Maine. We came back to Cape Elizabeth. My husband and I met in New York City, but we knew this is where we wanted to be because of all the wonderful things that exist here. And I was really astounded to hear some of these mm. problems that we're facing as a town, not just in the schools, but as a town overall. And it concerns me that we're not um, that we may not address these issues that have been existing for a while. The kindergarten space, um, what I understand is that the kindergarten has been in the high school for about 10 years. I think that pretty much indicates that that's a long-term problem. Um, if there wasn't a problem, they would have been moved back to the um, elementary school where they belong. And actually, I think even that problem existed even before the high school. But anyway. Um, so I urge you to look at these issues, um, the municipal uh, maintenance issues, um, just keeping us, instead of just saying we can't have anything over 2% without recognizing what kind of a cost we're going to face as a community over the long term, um, I think we just need to try to achieve some sort of balance. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Susan Sagnol and I live at 2 Heatherstone Lane and I guess I'm sort of making an emotional plea tonight on behalf of the children in our community who have no voice, so tonight I am their voice. Um, it's my understanding that the town council has set a 2% cap 
on school expenditures for the 2003-2004 fiscal year. Um, when I went to the Maine Department of Education Data Center today, their website, um, trying to rifle through the figures, I did learn that per pupil expenditures increased an average 6.5% in 2001 to 2002 in the state of Maine, and this compared to a 2.1 increase for Cape Elizabeth. I also learned, which this data is a little bit different from what was just presented by Rebecca, uh, because I think they, take it, they don't take into account um, transportation and capital outlays, but what it did show was that per pupil expenditures had fallen from 25 for Cape Elizabeth in the state for 1994-95 to 99 in 2001-2002. After reviewing these figures, I became quite concerned with the 2% cap recommended by you and would ask you if this is purely a financial decision or did you take into account the quality of education for our children. We moved to Cape Elizabeth almost two years ago from a Massachusetts community where the dialogue between town meeting members and selectmen and the school board members was healthy and productive. The schism that I and others have witnessed between Cape Elizabeth town council and school board worries me and I do not assign blame but I feel it is not in the best interest of our children. Cape Elizabeth needs to be investing in the three things that will improve student performance. High quality teachers, small class sizes, and a learning environment that is safe and conducive to learning. I would argue that Tom Priscilla, working with his administrators and the school board, is best able to establish a budget to meet these objectives, and that their recommendations should be heeded. They are the export, experts. Excuse me. Of course, you do need to be conservative given current difficult financial times, which everyone has addressed tonight. You do not want to overburden Cape Elizabeth taxpayers. However, this does not mean that we should abandon our investment in our children. If you cut school programs or teachers, in the short term, taxpayers may smile while the education of our children suffers. In the long term, if we do not remain committed to our schools, we all suffer. Our school system will not be able to attract strong teachers, people will want not want to move to our community and our real estate values will decline and our students will not be well prepared to make a significant contribution to our society. Your decision about the school budget should not only be about, about the numbers. This year and going forward, working cooperatively with the school board, you must consider the long-term investment in Cape Elizabeth children. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? My name is Sue Pierce, and I live on Hunts Point Road, and I promise I'll try not to speak about the school building project tonight. Um, when I came tonight, there's a lot of new information um, that I gathered, um, so I don't have anything as prepared. But one thing that I am concerned about, when I looked at other preliminary school budgets for surrounding towns, um, Gorham, um, an increase of 11.8%, Scar Scarborough, 6.65%, Cumberland North Yarmouth, 5.95%, um, South Portland, 3.7%, Yarmouth, 3.5%, Falmouth, 3.17% in spending, and then Cape, 2.75%. I, I have some of the same concerns that we are putting off some things that need to be, um, that we shouldn't be putting off, and that this, in the long run, will hurt our schools. Maybe this needs to be done for one more year, but I think that um, some of the educational programs that have been put off, some of the um, infrastructure things obviously need to be done, and um, I asked the council to look at the 2.75% as a very reasonable um, increase in spending, especially compared to the now 3%. Um, also when you're looking at the tax rate, that now it's a 2.5% versus the municipal, which now will come in at 3.75, county at 3.75, and I'm not sure what the community service number. I think the school board did um, an excellent job in trying to meet that goal, and um, I hope that the school budget is approved. Thank you. Is there anyone else? 
My intent is to keep my mouth shut tonight. Having spoken in the last couple of meetings, James P. Eastman, Woodland Road. I taught 20 years at SMBTI, and I saw the results of poor elementary high school education. I taught physics. Can you imagine teaching real physics with people who can't basically do algebra when they come there? Uh, what I have to say basically is a plea to not in any way lower the standards. I think probably we have a better standards than most. <clears throat> but I had uh, kids who, I, I started with a test zero. And I told them this was your final exam. I like to get things done ahead of time. But basically it was adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing fractions, doing basic algebra. This in the physics course where they had just come from algebra and supposedly algebra. And you'd be horrified at some of the results I got on my test zero. Uh, the math department was a little bit unhappy about my test zero also. I had people coming to math through physics who just couldn't do the math. Some of the people in the math department shouldn't have been there. They were too highfalutin to teach these kids math. They were up in computers and calculus. They were great for that. They're teaching low grade. And you did get it down in the high school, in that sort of place. I had kids who said, gee, I got B in physics in high school. I said, did you have problems? We had a few. But physics is problem solving if it's done right. And granted, the dean tried to get me to teach conceptual physics to some of the students. but. Uh, the proof of the pudding is in the problems, basically. And we, we, we can't short that investment in any way. I was, as I said, I was going to keep quiet, but then having been in the business of getting the product of the high schools, uh, I had no complaint with the Cape schools. I didn't get many Cape students, as a matter of fact, but from all around. As for the infrastructure over there, uh, I would say this and back up the maintenance people who probably told you the same thing. If the roof leaks, fix it. Because underneath the leaking roof is some steel. And when the steel starts to rust, it expands 13 times and pushes out the bricks. Uh, those of you who remember the hassle many years ago about Fort Williams, that already had happened. The buildings were basically beyond repair. So we burned them. I was on the fire department. And, uh, you, you just you, some things you can put off, some things you can't. Maybe you don't paint the walls that are peeling because of the leak, but you got to fix the leak so it doesn't make things any worse. And I think I had some other things in mind, but I think we've probably heard enough. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Okay, I'll have I'll ask the town manager to answer some of the questions that were asked as we went along this evening, and then um, if anyone on the council wants to say anything, we can do that. Just a couple of comments, and then I'll answer I'll answer two questions as well. I'm glad Mr. Eastman clarified when he was talking about the Fort Williams Park buildings. We burned them. I'm glad you clarified that you did it as a member of the fire department. So, <laughs> get nervous there. Get nervous there for a second. Uh, Mr. Dennison had asked, uh, was within the municipal budget where the wage increase is the same for everyone, you know, low paid versus high paid? As, as I mentioned, it's 2.5% for the dispatchers and the police officers who are covered under the police contract. The budget contains 3% for the public works employees in the public works bargain, bargaining unit and 3% for all other employees. He asked if it was the same for those that are making more than 100,000. Uh, <laughs> there isn't anyone making over 100,000, so <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. There was, uh, Mr. Babcock had mentioned full day kindergarten. The just to clarify, the school plan, it wasn't, was Mr. Who, who mentioned, someone mentioned that. This gentleman over here, thank you. The school plan, as proposed by the school board, the, the building project is for half-day kindergarten. It's not for full-day kindergarten as proposed, but I did want to clarify that. Is a sticker required uh, for the dump, or whatever we're going to call it? Uh, 
yes, the policy provides that a sticker is required. However, a lot of folks, including myself, uh, don't have one in their car currently. And uh, it, is, it is a case of, uh, you know, that the folks over there do know the folks quite well, but I would agree that it's probably time to do a replacement of all the stickers. We, we try to do that every three or four years, and it's now gone to about every five years. It's gone about five years since we've last done it, so I would think it would be behoove us to do that sometime soon so that uh, we make sure that there aren't folks like me who once lived in town who moved out, which I didn't do, but uh, you do need to watch those that move out that they don't keep uh, visiting our, our area. Uh, the hazardous waste we discussed, the DARE program. I did write to Paul Gaspar, who is a police officer, who is responsible for the DARE program, encouraging him to look at other programs which would address some of the same issues. There was a, there's been a lot of studies on the DARE program that have questioned its effectiveness, and most recently one from the General Accounting Office uh, that has said uh, specifically that uh, there is absolutely no indication that communities with DARE programs have any, have any better results than those without DARE programs. So uh, we, we are going to look at, look at other programs. And, and DARE is partially funded in 1900 by municipal government. The Lions Club has been very supportive of it over the years as well. The Rotary Clubs uh, put some funds into it as well as some individual citizens. Uh, I mean, the only other thing I wanted to mention was that uh, Sue Pierce had mentioned comparing other communities in, in their budgets. And in, in fact, one of the counselors had asked me to do that. I forget which one. And looking at out the, even the municipal budgets, how they compared to others. And I took the position with the councillor, and they didn't persist, that it really wasn't all that meaningful. Uh, that what you need to look <coughs> at is, I think, that the slide set in the PowerPoint, you know, is the school enrollment changing in a particular community, in what degree? Uh, is there new debt service, or is the debt service that's being retired? Mm -hmm. uh, are there additional special needs, you know, folks uh, coming into the system. Uh, you know, the inflation is just about the same everywhere, but I think if you really dug into a lot of those budgets, you would see that of those other communities that they may not be in the same position that we are in terms of relatively level enrollment and the fact that our debt service is declining while some of these other communities I met today with the, some other managers where you know, they were describing major new initiatives on debt service in their budget. So while I think you know, those numbers are instructive, I think you really need to dig a little deeper into them uh, to find out uh, you know, if, in fact, they are meaningful. And, you know, I would encourage anyone to do that to see, see in fact, uh, if they are meaningful. I did a little more than answer the questions, but I did want to clarify some thinking on your issues as well. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're making these clarifications. I think it would be helpful for people to understand that we have two future, you can explain, two figures before us that constantly come out from members of the public, and that is the cost per pupil and the cost per capita per pupil. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that those are two completely different figures, and maybe you can explain that better so that people understand that, because you can't compare the two things. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do it. Uh, we looked at some benchmarking recently that looked at strictly cost per capita. And Cape Elizabeth, in many areas of that, came out on the very high side. And that, that's a concern for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the, the primary one is that in Cape Elizabeth, property tax is borne almost entirely by resident taxpayers. <coughs> it's not borne by seasonal taxpayers, and it's not borne by commercial properties. So when you look at those numbers in, in the benchmark study that, that was done, it, it gives rise to concern. However, when you, you, the other side of it is when you look at per pupil, uh, you know, as, as has been said by a number of individuals, uh, we are in fact uh, not at the very top anymore. We're, where we once were, we're, we're further down on the scale and we're falling as other communities have, have upgraded this system. We also, I looked at the State Department of Education website, and they divide things into transportation, into administration, sort of general administration, then school administration, uh, debt service, 
uh, libraries and health, and there's a couple of other things, and instruction. W what was interesting as you know, I looked at the, the top 50 communities in, in each of those categories, what it, it again showed was that in most of those areas, Cape Elizabeth was not at the very top. Uh, even debt service with you know, the big school project that was, that was done a few years ago, we, a lot of other communities have taken on a tremendous amount of additional, uh, additional debt, and we, we're, well down, we're well down the pack now. Uh, instruction, uh, operation maintenance, we, we, weren't, we weren't at the very top. Uh, and you know, some of that, I think we're very fortunate with the campus, that we are on a single campus and that there's economic efficiencies uh, from that. So you look at all those statistics, Penny, and you know, for the, other than the benchmarks on the per capita, which, which is of concern, the rest of them show that, you know, that really compared to other communities, the school department is not extravagant. And on the municipal side, we do tend to be very generous with parks and recreation. The library was on the high side, and uh, public works was quite low. That's one reason when, when you see budget cuts, that wasn't an area that I looked at uh, too extensively. Yeah. If I could just add something to that, because I've got a whole bunch of letters over the past few months asking mm -hmm. me about the, the same sort of issue per capita per pupil cost and I was curious about it so I I went on a website too I went on the Department of Education yeah, a lot website. of people going on the website I know we're just bur well Good. I know this was a few weeks ago burning up the the band broadband here but um, it's very interesting if you look at main school districts ranked by operating cost you look at the top 10 um, and look, it, this is based on 2001-2002 per pupil operating costs, and it does, the data doesn't include debt or transportation. Um, the absolute number one one is North Haven, which is SAD7. Number two is Islesboro. Number three is Easton. Then there's J, Lubeck, which is SAD19. Wiscasset, Greenville, then Southport, excuse me, South Portland, Yarmouth, Falmouth. Um, you start you start dropping off. Yarmouth is 10th, but Falmouth is 23rd. Pennybunk. I started trying to look at ones that are in the area here. Pennybunk is 24th. Cape Elizabeth was 48th. So then I started saying, okay, well, North Haven and Islesboro and Easton and Jay, you know, I'm not criticizing their school systems, but I, they're not the school systems that spring to mind as pr the premier school systems in the state that I think of. Um, as I think of in Cape Elizabeth because we have a wonderful school system here. So I started trying to figure out how did the per pupil operating costs tie into MEA data, which was just a handy way to look at it. And I got on a different website and got the, M the MEA data. And it showed if you look at the grade 11 MEA data and composite, you just sort of add all the MEA, MEA data to the different subjects together. Um, Greeley came out number first, number one. Um, and they spend $5,861 uh, $5, um, per pupil operating cost. They're 101st ranked on per pupil operating cost. Yarmouth had the second highest MEA scores, and they spend $8,248 per pupil, which makes them 10th on the list. Cape Elizabeth was third on the MEA scores. and. We're separated, just so everybody feels good. We're separated by only a few points from those first two. And the per pupil operating cost for 2001-2002, um, not including debt or transportation, was 7,024, according to the state. Um, and that put us 48th, rank number, we rank number 48 on per pupil operating cost. So what I tried to do was just look at how do these numbers tie together. And I think it, what it illustrated to me was something that I had read before in, in national um, literature on the subject, was that per pupil operating costs, while an interesting figure in the same way that per capita um, spending is an interesting figure, it doesn't, it's not the be all and end all of everything. Greeley spends a lot, a significant amount less than us. They're 101st on the list and they get higher MEA scores. Yarmouth spends uh, about a thousand more than us, 
and um, they're higher than us. And then CAPE is sort of right in the middle. So I'm not sure that per pu while per pupil spending is an important piece of information, I'm not sure that that is the only piece of information that people should be looking at. There are other pieces of information like per capita spending, and they, they all have different slices of the same data. So I hope that was illuminating. I found it interesting, but um, I know I've gotten a, a number of emails about the, about the subject, so I just wanted to let people know what I discovered. Thank you. Anyone else would like to say anything? Um, Councillor Barry? I know uh, one thing that hasn't been mentioned tonight, uh, and I don't know if it's the appropriate time, but the county uh, budget. Uh, mm -hmm. Councilor McGinney and I have both served mm -hmm. on the budget advisory committee for the county and watched it go up, 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 and in spite of our uh, uh, good work. <laughs> and uh, I, I wonder if uh, uh, Mike McGovern might have a couple of suggestions on uh, uh, <laughs> what we might do to approach the <coughs> uh, issues that, uh, that seem to be driving that, uh, that budget so uh, hard. I just got my, by the way, I just got my 2003 annual budget uh, adopted on March 26th. They go by the calendar year. So I just got the final budget yeah. uh, this week. I don't mean to avoid the, the question, Councilor Barry, but you know, <laughs> Through your efforts and, and John's uh, and other counselors as well, Cape Elizabeth did give long lists to the county of potential areas to look at, yeah. and in most of those areas there, there wasn't uh, uh, much cooperation from the county uh, in looking at them. My hope would be that maybe you could uh, form some alliances with fellow Budget Advisory Committee members over the next year as well as uh, look at some of the reform issues uh, that are before the legislature yeah. to deal with county government because under the current system there's virtually little, there's virtually no control and uh -huh. the budgets keep increasing tremendously. Thank you. And I'd be happy to provide the list of detail again on what we ask the county to look at. Anyone else? Well, consistent with my theory that 90% of Meetings in Maine end at 10 after 9. We're <laughs> close. Um, but I wanted to just spend a minute to go over the schedule for the public, it's just housekeeping matters, and uh, request one change in the schedule for the council, or two changes. Um, we have coming up a our first workshop on the specific department budgets on April 2nd. Uh, we have a workshop on, again, specific town department budgets on April 7th. We will finish up the town budgets on April 17th, and we will review the school budget on April 28th. We had previously set aside April 30th for additional review of the school budget. I'm not sure if that's needed. Um, and we would like to have a presentation of the revaluation on April 30th. So we use that night for that and turn that back over to Jack and the full council. Um, one change I would like to request, I've run into several um, citizens recently who expressed to me a concern that they, because of their inability to drive at night, cannot attend meetings at 7 o'clock. So uh, in particular, uh, this meeting, it, they would have liked to have come to. So I'd like to ask the council if on the night of April 17th, we could meet at 6 p.m. That would still be daylight, and that would provide citizens in the town who no longer drive at night the ability to come out and have the same input tonight that all of you have. So if that's acceptable to all of you on the 17th, at 6 p.m., we'd make that schedule change. A April 17th. April 17th. Otherwise, all of our meetings will uh, begin at 7:30 in the um, conference room in the back of the building, which the public is welcome to. I want to thank you all again for coming tonight, and um, send us your emails or call us if you have other thoughts on the budget. Thank you. At 6 p.m. on a Thursday, right?